Hey everyone, it's Bobby Sylvester, and we've got a high upside wide receiver episode for you today with John Paulson of 444.com. But first, I want to tell you about Draft. This is my go-to platform for best ball leagues, and they kill it with DFS too. It's not like the other big platforms where you have a budget to build your team. On Draft, you actually do a snake draft like the ones we do at the start of our season-long leagues. I can't get enough of it. And then their best ball leagues are terrific. There's a sleek and easy to use design and you can do fast or slow draft best ball leagues. You can find them in the app store or on Android by just typing in draft and they're going to show up first. We've also got a free entry into a best ball league to give you if you sign up using playdraft.com slash fantasy pros so that they know we sent you. All right, let's talk some football. Welcome back to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast with Mike Tagliere, and I'm Bobby Sylvester. Hey, Tags, how's it going, man? It's going, man. We had a football game last night, and there's uh, I'm sure we're going to talk about some of that stuff. And there was kind of a lot of takeaways, some that are kind of off the wall I want to bring up to you guys. I actually had a dream about it, and I was kind of laughed at for saying it. So I'm going to see if I'm going to get laughed at on the podcast for saying what happened in my dream. Yeah, this is going to be interesting. Anyway, our uh, our guest today is John Paulson, as I mentioned, of 444.com, and he is always one of the most accurate experts. I'm looking forward to picking his brain today, and you can find him on Twitter at 444 underscore John. John, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. It's great to be here. It's our pleasure. So it's always funny to me, guys, how every single preseason, someone makes a nice play and their ADP skyrockets. All of a sudden, after that nice touchdown grab last night, Kelvin Benjamin is getting so much love and it's driving me nuts. John, how much stock do you actually put in a preseason performance? I don't really watch the preseason uh, yeah. the games live at all. Like I, I'll, I'll sometimes go back and, and look at uh, Game Pass and if there's a player that I'm not familiar with, a rookie or a young player that's sort of emerging, I'll look at his plays to try to save myself some time. But sitting there and watching uh, the preseason, I think I'll pull out my what's left of my hair. <laughs> there is, uh, there's too much else to do right now. Tags, I guess you watched the game. So what were your takeaways? I mean, did Benjamin actually look impressive or was it just the one highlight catch? Okay, it was a highlight catch, and I'll give him that. Like, it was a fantastic catch. There's no, there's no missing that. It did happen. Okay, and I, I mean, don't you think like that. Nelson Aguilar could have made that catch, and then everyone would be freaking not. out about him? He he couldn't catch one that went in his chest. So we don't need to talk about Aguilar. But no, my takeaway that I wanted to talk about is not necessarily Kevin Kelvin Benjamin. He did have a great catch in that, and you know Devin Funch has played nine of nine snaps with the starters, which is which is good news for him. We're going to talk about him a little bit later. But my news, my, what I wanted to talk about, I had a dream about it, in that I was standing there with my friend. We were talking about Christian McCaffrey, and I, I brought up, I was like, "Does it is it just me, or does he look even smaller in the NFL than he did in college? And I was worried about his size coming out and whether or not he could handle you know, the workload that people are projecting him to have. They're drafting him over Joe Mixon. They're drafting him over Leonard Fournette in Dynasty Drafts. I, I never understood it. So seeing him on the football field last night... I was like, Christian McCaffrey looks really like more like a Darren Sproles type than he does more like like a Leonard Fournette. John, what? I mean, you didn't watch it, but what is your take on Christian McCaffrey? Did you were you worried about his size before? You know, I guess maybe seeing him last night because that's my takeaway from him is just that he doesn't look big at all. Well, it, I would say that it's not that big a deal for him, given the role that he's likely to have with the Panthers. I mean, I think they, they drafted him to, to get the running backs involved in the passing game and have him be a primary pass catcher in that offense. Uh, that, you know, whether or not Cam Newton will um, cooperate and dump the ball off to him uh, frequently is another is another matter. But yeah. they're not asking with, with with Jonathan Stewart there. They're not asking him to carry the ball a ton. And I think he'll he'll be fine as long as they keep those touches, those carries between the tackles uh, to a minimum. So are we talking about like he's going to be a Duke Johnson type of player and a Danny Woodhead type of player? I mean, obviously different size and everything, but like, is that what he's limited to? Or are we actually going to see 150 carries? Well, I, you know, I don't think he's going to see a ton of carries this year with, with Stewart still in the mix. I mean, if Stewart gets injured, which is, let's face it, not a, a unlikely proposition, then you could see uh, McCaffrey in more of a feature role. Um, but I think to start, you're going to look at, at Stewart with 10 to 15 carries and then McCaffrey sprinkling in for six to eight carries with, with maybe four or five catches. Yeah, to start the offseason, my projection models were I had McCaffrey up up around like 160, 170 carries, and I've been slowly lowering that down. After seeing it last night with Jonathan Stewart out there being the base, basically the primary one, two down back, I'm lowering McCaffrey even a little bit more. I wasn't too high in dynasty on him compared to the rest 
rest of the field. So last night didn't do any favors. But Bobby, what do you think of Deshaun Watson? I know a lot of people are walking away saying that they liked Watson. I'll be honest, Tags, all I saw were the highlights, and uh, I've always been impressed with Watson. I think he was the best quarterback in this draft class. I know that hurts for you to hear because you're uh, a Bears fan and they drafted Trubitsky number two, but, you know, Watson is the most accurate. He's the most polished. He's ready to go. He's better than Tom Savage as far as I'm concerned. Put him in there. The Texans are going to be in the race, so it's time to get your best quarterback on the field, even if he's not exactly ready. Well, being better than Tom Savage is not like an accomplishment or anything. So I just want to be clear about that. Um, my takeaways from Deshaun Watson from watching, because I did watch pretty much the entire game. Uh, Watson, he's always on the move. Like he's he, he he looked comfortable. He looked poised and all that. But it looks like he he's like looking to scramble more often than he needs to than standing tall in the pocket. And he was facing like he stayed into the third quarter. So he was facing a lot of second, third stringers. So I'm not going to take too much out of it because, you know, the same people who are taking doing good takeaways from Deshaun Watson. Watson are the same people that were saying, oh, Blake Bortles, it's still a preseason game. You can't take too much away from it. You know, we have to look at these things, but it's it's telling that Tom Savage wasn't out there for very long. So I think that they clearly view him as the starter and they wanted to get Sean Watson the reps to see how he handled them. Uh, it, I'll be curious to see how they handle it the second preseason game. You know, I actually disagree. I, I don't think he was trying to scramble. You watch Deshaun Watson play in college, and it's the same exact thing he was doing. He creates openings with his legs. When there's the threat of him scrambling and he starts to roll out to the outside, suddenly the defensive backs break down because they have to you know, chop their legs and get in position to make a tackle if Watson is to take off so they can make the right angle. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, wide receivers become available. That's what Watson does best. I don't know. The offensive line is not great there in Houston. I'll say that, you know, they were back in the area in foster days. They had a great offensive line. It's not that same line anymore. So there's concerns for sure with me. I think Watson, I think they should take their time with him. I don't think this is a Super Bowl team, Uh, but you know, we'll see as the preseason goes on. Yeah. So John, the Bengals apparently turned down a second round pick for AJ McCarron. Is this a joke? Well, they probably have uh, Super Bowl aspirations and want to have a backup plan in case uh, Andy Dalton uh, goes down. That offensive line is not very good either, so there's a good chance that he's going to take a ton of sacks, and maybe they're just trying to keep that uh, that backup plan in, in, in place. Tags, what do you think about this, man? It's a it's A.J. McCarron. Like, is he a top 10 backup in football? They, they could go sign Colin Kaepernick today or Kyle Orton, and I think either of them would far and away be better than A.J. McCarron, so why not take the second-round pick then just go do that? Well, Kyle Orton's probably drunk somewhere, right? And um, <laughs> Colin, Ka- Colin Kaepernick, I'm not I'm not part of Colin Kaepernick supporters. Like, whatever your feeling is, I just don't think he's a very good quarterback. That's my take on Colin Kaepernick. But, you don't think he's better than McCarron? Uh, I don't know if he's better than McCarron. We haven't seen enough to judge that. But no, I, as of right now, I would rather have McCarron as my franchise quarterback than Colin Kaepernick. And I don't know if that's a hot take, but I, I, I prefer a pocket passer who's going to last a long time. I think Colin Kaepernick's getting to the age where his legs are going to start leaving him and he's going to have to rely on his arm. And his arm has never been an accurate enough one. That's to not good. On. So yeah, so that's my that's my case there. But think about it. Like last offseason, Sam Bradford went for a first round pick. So would it shock me to see McCarron return a second? No. Uh, I think that if you're going to go out and do that, I think Garoppolo would be the, the more experienced one. But as we've talked about on the show, I don't think the Patriots are ready to move on. I think that they're preparing for life without Tom Brady next year. And I think that they're going to try and bring back Jimmy Garoppolo. And that's why they yeah. didn't trade him. You know, something else with the uh, the Cincinnati Bengals. The Cincinnati Inquirer reported that Jeremy Hill might just start the entire season unless he's injured or terrible. So, Tag, since we already know he's terrible, can we just roll that one out? <laughs> this is the second beat writer. So, to be fair, I'm curious to hear John's take on this, being one of the most accurate experts. But uh, Joe Mixon is someone that we've had a disagreement on the show with, with guests, myself. Some agree with me, some don't. Are you drafting Joe Mixon in the top two or three rounds uh, confidently at this point, John? Well, not with these types of reports coming out, uh, and the I know the depth charts at this point in the in the off season are not, uh, you know, real stable or written in stone. But they had Mixon in the with the third team, they had Hill with the first team, and that's just when you start getting into this this point mid August, and that's still going on, and you have beat writers saying that Hill's going to start or until unless he's terrible. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> then, uh, yeah. So uh, it, it, it's tough to draft Mixon in the third round. That's the pro- that's the problem for me because he's, he's his ADP is in the, in the third round. You have multiple guys going in the fourth, fifth, sixth round that I don't think uh, are that much different in terms of uh, their situation and the security of the situation. Uh, I would pass on Mixon there and hope that I can get him later on if, if he, his ADP starts to drop. 
Yeah, for sure. And Bobby, if you missed it, Marvin uh, Lewis came out and said that he wants to see how Joe Mixon does in pass protection. That's like his biggest thing because Jeremy Hill and Gio Bernard are known as is to be pretty good pass blockers. And it's going to be required that they stay in and do that. Now, Mixon was really good in college when it came to pass blocking. So I don't really have any concerns about that. And I do think that eventually he takes over the job. But, you know, uh, I know we talked about this a little bit yesterday, so I don't want to harp on it too much. Um, it kind of reminds me of Thomas Rawls. Like this time last year, Thomas Rawls was going at the end of the third round round beginning of the fourth and like we didn't even know if he was going to be the running back and we all know how that one turned out I mean Christine Michael took over ended up leading the uh, the Seahawks in in rushing yards which isn't really saying much because it was he was behind Tyrod Taylor for rushing yards on the season but Thomas Rawls just disappeared people were drafting him really early yeah, that's actually, it's a great transition. Uh, Thomas Rawls is the last, well, Martavis Bryant, the whole reinstated thing, you know, we could talk about that, but Thomas Rawls is the transition here in that they're saying that Rawls is the number one running back in Seattle right now, that that earlier this week, him and Lacey were, were splitting first team reps, and then ever since that one practice, Rawls has been getting all the first team reps. We don't know if it has to do with Lacey's ankle, if he's still trying to come back from that, if he's trying to learn the offense. We have no idea, but the fact that Thomas Rawls is getting first team reps over Eddie Lacey right now is a bit telling because he's a veteran, obviously. Uh, so I think Lacey is a guy that's been moving down my draft board this offseason. Uh, John, do you have a good take on the Seattle backfield? Yeah, I mean, I had him, I had Lacey fairly low to start this offseason yeah, just because. Me too. Just because, I mean, I think he's good, but he, you can't count on his health. And he's joining a backfield that already has Thomas Rawls. You also have uh, C.J. Procise there, likely uh, the third down back. And it's just one of these muddled backfields. And on top of it, you have his weight issue. You have his doghouse issue with, uh, you know, with the Packers. And maybe that repeats itself with Seattle if he starts to gain weight. Um, and then he, he hasn't been able to stay uh, fully healthy. So uh, I think Rawls is definitely the value right now, uh, given uh, what's going on there. And it's just one of these backfields. I really don't want uh, to, to invest too heavily in it. But if I'm going to take somebody, it's either going to be Procise or, or Rawls in late rounds. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at this miserable offensive line, too. And Eddie Lacy doesn't necessarily fit that scheme. Thomas Rawls, he runs so hard. He creates, you know, he falls forward. Um you know, he's always just blasting people. He's probably going to get hurt in three weeks because of the way that he runs. But I have no problem with the Seahawks starting him whatsoever. I don't think the difference in talent, uh, I'm sorry, in, in what I would expect in production would be that much different between Rawls and Lacey. Lacey's clearly more talented, but Rawls just fits the scheme a little more, in my opinion, Tags. Well, I, I've talked about CJ Procise. Procise is the one I want out of this backfield. I don't think that I'd want to own Lacey or Rawls at this point, just considering how the state of the offensive line. I don't think any running back can average more than four yards per carry behind it. Now, granted, they're going to score a lot more touchdowns than, than most offenses. They're going to rank. Uh, I mentioned that on yesterday's show that the Seattle Seahawks, since Russell Wilson came to that team, they have ranked top nine in scoring uh, in every single year except last year, which was obviously wow. the one where Russell Wilson, you know, was dealing with his multiple legs injuries where he was basically had duct tape on his legs and keeping him together so you know that's that's the that's where you can hang your hat saying that you want one of Lacey or Rawls but I think it's going to be a headache from week to week uh they spent money on on Lacey but the good part though the good part is that Pete Carroll doesn't care about contracts he really doesn't he he will start the best player and if you know if it happens to be Rawls he doesn't care that they spent money on Lacey it wasn't that big of a contract to begin with so um but yeah I I, I think that I think it sums it up basically in the fact that none of us feel real confident about this backfield. Yeah. So Tags, you mentioned that Devin Funches was working out with the starters and Jalen Strong is two for the Texans. Do either of these guys intrigue you towards the end of drafts, John? Oh, I mean, I think Funches is starting to trend up in my rankings. Uh, there's been good reports uh, on him in camp. And as, as uh, Tags mentioned, uh, he played all the snaps with the starters yesterday and he's still really young i mean there's been multiple people pointing that out that he's still younger than some of the rookies coming into the league so there is some upside there uh mike clay was on my podcast uh talking about uh, the the um you mentioned kelvin kelvin benjamin the the matchups that he has cornerback wise i think you could could argue that uh funches has similar uh type schedule and it's uh, this whole offense passing offense is due for a bounce back and that could uh lift benjamin uh funches and cam newton up uh together Tags, what do you think about Strong? I mean, is he going to be able to hold off Braxton Miller? Does it matter in this Houston offense? 
No, it doesn't matter. And then that's the, to answer the question. No, there's not. I wouldn't draft either of them in fantasy. I know Jake was on our show uh, just a couple days ago and talking about Braxton Miller, how he thinks he's worth a late flyer. I don't think either of them are. I think it's a tight end heavy offense. I think that DeAndre Hopkins is still going to see plenty of targets. And the only reason that Strong is running with the starters is because Will Fuller is out with a broken collarbone. So, you know, we're going to he, he's probably going to miss a few games to start the season. But Strong is like a touchdown or bust option for me. And it's not to say he's a bad player because I think Strong has kind of been forgotten about a little bit uh but at the same time in a read from a redraft standpoint uh, you you shouldn't want to touch either of them okay guys we're going to take a step away before we move on to these high upside wide receiver segment to tell you about stamps.com these days you can get practically everything on demand like our podcast listen whenever you want when it's convenient for you so why are you still going to the post office and dealing with their limited hours when you can get postage on demand with stamps.com Folks, any single thing you can do at the post office, you can do right from your desk with Stamps.com. It's incredible. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter or package using your own computer and printer. And unlike the post office, Stamps.com never closes so you can get your postage when you need it 24-7. I put more value into my time than just about anything. So since I started using Stamps.com, I've saved so much time and I couldn't be more happy. I sincerely recommend this service to every single person listening. Just one trip prevented to the long lines is well worth the cost. And right now, Fantasy Pros even has a special offer for you with a four-week trial that includes postage and a digital scale. This offer is so great and they can do it because virtually everyone who takes advantage of the offer realizes just how great their service is and sticks around. I'm sure you will as well. So don't wait. Go to stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the radio microphone at the top of the homepage and type in fantasy pros. That's stamp.com and enter fantasy pros. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Okay, guys, let's talk about these high upside wide receivers, and we're going to do the same way we did with our last episode in the high upside running backs. We're just going to go round table. Tags, I want you to bring up a high upside wide receiver first and just give us your pitch on him, and uh, we'll tell you if we agree or disagree. Well, I I was going to bring up someone else first, but let's start with Funches. You know, we just started talking about him and the fact that, you know, his schedule is fantastic. The Panthers have one of the better schedules. You know, even the schedule starting off starts really well. And, you know, we've talked a lot about Christian McCaffrey and how he doesn't necessarily fit Cam Newton's strengths. What is Cam Newton's strength? He has a cannon for an arm. Whether or not he's accurate with it is a different story, but he has a cannon. Ted Ginn is gone. You know, uh, Calvin Benjamin is not going to be beating people 40 or 50 yards down the field. That's just not what he does. He's that possession receiver. He's that red zone guy. Uh, But now you have, you know, Curtis Samuel, a former running back. You have Christian McCaffrey. You have Greg Olson healthy for all these guys eat up those targets over the middle of the field. So that's not where I don't that's not where I think Funches is going to excel. But it's the deep game. He's, he's playing with the starters. And if you want to use Cam Newton towards his strengths, you need to throw the ball deep. And Devin Funches, over the first two years of his career, has averaged over 15 and a half yards per reception. Uh, he's caught a touchdown every 13.4 targets. To give you an idea as to how often that is, it's the same number that Michael Thomas posted in his rookie season last year. Wow. So obviously, uh, you know, it's hard to find someone in the double digit rounds like Funches who can offer double digit touchdown upside. And I think he does because, you know, he is six foot five. So not just Kelvin Benjamin in the red zone, but he can be one of those guys too. I just think that it's one of those guys, you know, it's a post hype sleeper last, last year in the preseason, we caught him. We saw him catch a, a circus touchdown in the red zone and everybody, you know, his ADP rocketed similar to the way that Calvin Benjamins is probably doing this morning. Uh, so for me, Funches has been a buy all off season. Ron Rivera has talked about, you know, we haven't used him to his full potential and we're going to change that this year. Seeing him out there for all snaps with the starters. I am ready to believe. And uh, one last stat I have Funches has seen 121 targets over his two year career produced 138.4 fantasy points with those targets. Calvin Benjamin saw just three targets less than that last year and scored four less fantasy points. So their efficiency has been roughly the same, despite the fact that, that Funches has been somewhat of a downfield threat. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about him and I don't think it would shock me to see Devin Funish the Funches finish as a top 40 wide receiver in standard and PPR leagues. I agree. I'm, I'm pretty high in Funches as well. I've got him, uh, the sleeper tag. I was higher on Curtis Samuel at the start of the season, but it just seems now like they're not going to use him as much as Funches. So I'm all on board. My only issue here is Cam Newton's hurt and Derek Anderson is even worse than Cam Newton. If you can believe that in passing and, uh, you know, they've got all these guys to pass to now. Calvin Benjamin's pretty good. Christian McCaffrey is probably going to be primarily used out of the slot. 
Um, and they've got Curtis Samuel, who they just added. So I'm just not really sure Funches is going to see enough balls for me to start him from week to week. But if there's an injury, yeah, I mean, I could see him being a flex play. Well, that's the thing is, so, I mean, if Cam Newton gets hurt and if Derek Anderson or Joe Webb is the starter there, I don't think anybody's really worth rostering in fantasy leagues, to be honest with you. I mean, maybe <laughs> rostering, but not startable. Uh, John, I know you said you're moving Funches up, you know, your, your board. How high are you moving him up and what are your concerns about him? Well, I was looking at Funchess, uh yesterday, and I, I moved him up to about a wide receiver five, I think 60-something in my rankings. And it's just my concern with it is his targets last year. I mean, you have Greg Olson, who's a heavily targeted tight end, 129 targets last year. Kelvin Benjamin, 118 targets last year. Ted Ginn's gone, so that opens up 95 targets, but they added Samuel. They added McCaffrey. Uh, you know, the running backs there didn't get many targets at all, and now you you know you're probably going to be targeting – uh, McCaffrey 70, 80 times. So, you know, I'm worried about week to week uh, stability. He's going to have to take some targets from Benjamin or from Olsen if he's going to, uh, you know, be a, an every week fantasy starter. So John, do you have a uh, high upside wide receiver for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, my, my number one target in the middle of the draft is Pierre Garcon. This is more for PPR formats, but he, he's a pretty good, uh, pretty good standard player as well. Uh, reunited with Kyle Shanahan in, in uh, Washington, or from Washington in San Francisco. Uh, last time they were together, 2013, Garcon caught 113 passes for 1,346 yards and five touchdowns. Not a huge red zone threat, but um, you know, given the the competition there for targets and the quality of the team, I think they're going to have to throw more than they'd like to. Uh, and he should see a, see a ton of targets. Uh, I think that's why Shanahan went out and got him because they wanted somebody you could trust in that wide receiver one spot. Yeah, I uh, I like Pierre Garcon quite a bit. I think he's the safest play outside the top 100 of anyone in football. Uh, Tags and I have talked about him quite a bit. Tags, do you want to add on to this though? Yeah, I mean Garcon is someone that worries me about his upside. I think he's one of the safest wide receivers to draft. I think he's a lock for wide receiver three production. I just don't know if I could see him finishing, you know, even as a wide receiver two. Uh, in standard formats just because the touchdown upside may not be there i mean you know, he could get about... 90 receptions right if he gets 90 receptions for, for sure. 1100 yards and five touchdowns that's still a, a top 14 wide receiver five touchdowns might even be stretching it with this offense i mean I'm, i mean kyle shanahan can work wonders and i i believe that but so looking at at the uh the research i did in terms of how much does team scoring matter for offenses so i think it's safe to project the 49ers to finish as a bottom 10 scoring offense which means that pierre garçon in terms of over the last five years like historically 15 percent chance on a bottom 10 offense to finish as a top 24 receiver. It's only a 13% chance to finish top 12. So it's it's going to be a rough sledding for him. Now, is like I said, he's one of the safest wide receivers to draft in that range, which is why he'll wind up on some of my teams if I have like Sammy Watkins, who's a very, you know, maybe like a high risk type guy, whereas, whereas Pierre Garçon is one of the safest guys in fantasy football for me. Absolutely. So uh, we're not going to talk about Kevin White or John Brown. We've done that virtually every single episode. Um, of course, Tags and I would say them both here. The first guy I want to talk about is actually Corey Davis. Uh, Corey Davis right now is listed as the number 41 wide receiver in terms of ADP. Expert consensus actually has him quite a bit lower than that. And I'm surprised. I've said this stat before, and I said it earlier today on the Christopher Harris podcast. Every single rookie wide receiver drafted within the top five was a top 25 wide receiver their rookie season in the past decade. That includes Braylon Edwards, and I understand this is a running offense. They added Eric Decker. They've already got Rashard Matthews, Delaney Walker. I understand that, but I look at this team, and even over Derrick Henry, I think Corey Davis is the single most talented player on this roster. I mean, you watch the film, and he checks every single box. He's big. He's fast. He's got strong hands. He's a crisp route runner. He's a warrior after the catch. He's got great instincts, great footwork. He has everything going for him. And I understand he might not get all the snaps right away, but I'm telling you when Corey Davis puts it together, and also these college schemes are much more fit to transition into the NFL. I think Corey Davis could surprise us. I mean, we saw what Michael Thomas did last year. You tell me Corey Davis isn't as talented or more than Michael Thomas? I totally believe it. I'm not saying Corey Davis is going to be a wide receiver number one, but there's that upside this year as a rookie. What's your take on him, John? Uh, I I just look at this offense. It's been run heavy. I think they've uh, invested heavily in the passing uh, game with Corey Davis, uh, Eric Decker. So that's good. That's a good sign for for the, the passing game in general and Marcus Mariota specifically. But with Delani Walker, Richard Matthews there, uh, Davis right now sidelined with a 
an injury sort of working his way back, missing some valuable reps. Uh, I just don't see any one of these guys dominating the targets enough to 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 get to that uh, wide receiver one or high-end wide receiver two type level. Uh, he could certainly finish in the top 20 if things break his way, but I think he's going to need an injury for that to happen uh, just because I think that uh, Mariota is just going to spread the ball around to all these talented receivers. Yeah, I'm, I'm with John on this one, and I'm a huge fan of Corey Davis in terms of his skill set. I've compared him to Brandon Marshall in the fact that his str- his hands are really strong. The, some of the best things he does is after the catch, but he does have great route running ability. So, But the, the, the problem is that he's still on the Titans, right? The Titans did say this offseason they were going to go out and invest equity in the position. They were going to spend money. They were, going, they were willing to spend equity in the draft picks, and they did. You know, getting Corey Davis at number five overall, they screamed, we are going to do this for you, Marcus. Then they go out and they draft Taewon Taylor. They go out and get Eric Decker. So there's a lot of options here, but here's my issue. I don't think that the Titans are going to pass a whole lot more in 2017. I think people are crazy to, to bump Mariota up into the number seven, number eight range just because of these additions. I think they want to run the football a lot, and I think they're going to run the football a lot. You know what's crazy is that I think the reason they wanted to bring in these wide receivers the way they did, going back and looking at it, so DeMarco Murray and Derrick Henry combined, they saw eight or more uh, man fronts almost 50% of the time, the league average is 30%. Like it's, it's ridiculous to think about how good they actually were last year, considering the, the, a great what point. they had in front of them. Their yes, their offensive line is doing well. I, th- I think that, that you're going to see some lighter fronts just because of who they brought in. Corey Davis needs to get on the field. That's first and foremost, as John said, he's missing some valuable reps with this hamstring injury. And it seems like he may not even be ready for week one, but um, love the talent, love him in dynasty. I think he's being undervalued in dynasty, but at, at this point I'm with, John and the fact that I don't think any of these receivers are going to finish top 24. All right, Tags, who's your number two guy? All right, so I'm going to, this one's kind of cheating, uh, and I'm not saying cheating, but I would feel like cheating because he shouldn't be outside the top 25, and that's Stefan Diggs. Stefan Diggs is, uh, I think he's an elite talent, and, and it, it's, it's hard to justify saying that he can finish as a top 12 guy, but last year he kind of showed glimpses of it, right? Uh, he's a fantastic route runner. He can burn you. My issue is that Pat Shermer, once he took over from Norv Turner, decided to move Stefan Diggs into the slot. From that moment forward, he played 73% of his snaps out of the slot. And, and if you pay attention to slot numbers versus perimeter numbers in terms of yards per route run, they're a lot lower from the slot. Now, will you be better in PPR leagues? Sure. Uh, that's why I think in PPR leagues, you need to consider Stefan Diggs right next to Jarvis Landry and Golden Tate. They're all in that similar tier, but I would argue that Stefan Diggs has the highest upside because I don't think that he should be locked into the slot role. I think he's a phenomenal athlete, phenomenal hands. He's shown it. If you've ever watched the, like, if you've ever sat down and just watched some players run some routes, Stefan Diggs is among the best in the league when it comes to route running. He has limited upside in terms of Sam Bradford throwing to him, although those two did have a connection last year, completing 75% of the passes to Diggs. So are you guys with me on this and the fact that Diggs is an elite talent? And he may not reach that that wide receiver one ceiling, but that he's much safer than the wide receiver 30 that he's being drafted at right now. Uh, I would just uh, say that I do the injury reports over at 444, so I paid close attention to injuries, which guys are dinged up going into each game. And I noticed a a big disparity with Diggs when he was on the injury report, uh, nicked up, and when he was completely off the injury report. When he was on the injury report, he averaged four catches for 37 yards and .14 touchdowns per game. That was uh, seven games uh, where he was uh, not healthy. And then there was uh, six games where he was not on their injury report. He averaged 9.3 catches, 107 yards. 0.33 0.33 touchdowns per game and there's 11.5 targets per game so he's someone that uh, you know especially in like DFS or if you have him as a wide receiver two wide receiver three you may want to look and see what his health levels at because if he's healthy he's he's been on fire and if he's been dinged up he hasn't been able to produce uh, much through those injuries so that, that's something I'm looking uh, towards with Diggs every each and every week when I'm ranking him. Yeah, for sure. And well, on top of that, his schedule is among the best in the NFL. And I know some people say strength of schedule, this and that, but looking at the cornerbacks on his schedule, there's not one that I'm scared of. And on top of that, cover corners, a lot of those guys don't even go into the slot, which is where obviously he was playing a lot under Shermer. So I am not worried about that. Stefan Diggs is like, I, I find myself having to stop and say, man, how high do I keep pushing this guy? Like I have to stop at some point, but I'm, I'm excited to see what he can do. Yeah, I mean, Diggs is really talented. I won't go as far as saying he's an elite talent, though. I mean, I would reserve elite for maybe the top eight wide receivers in the league. I bet I could come up with 15 that I think are more talented than Diggs. I think he's got substantial upside, don't hear me wrong. But they also have, you know, 
the Vikings, you don't think of them as having a lot of depth at wide receiver. They've got plenty of talent there. Um, so I'm not so sure that Diggs is going to get as many targets as he would need to maybe end up being a top 15 wide receiver. With that said, I mean, if he does get those targets, sky's the limit, right? For sure. And I, that, that stat that John threw out there, I, I put that, I had that exact stat inside of my, uh, in my player profile profile for Stefan Diggs. So if you guys want to read up more on Diggs and why I love him, uh, check it out in his player profile. It's uh, it's very detailed, including those injury reports because Diggs was just a different player when he was healthy. All right, John. So who's your number two wide receiver here? Well, I'm going to throw out uh, a name. I think he's an undervalued uh, player, but he also has top 20, top 15 upside is Tyrell Williams in San Diego. Uh, Mike Williams, my guy. Uh, you're right. Yeah, his his uh, uh, his ADP has been kind of beat down because of the uh, draft pick of uh, Mike Williams. But Mike Williams is obviously dealing with a back injury. He's missed all of camp. He's, he may not be ready to start the season. So I don't think that Tyrell Williams is in any danger of losing his job to him. Uh, he stepped in for uh, Keenan Allen last year when Allen got injured and finished as the number 12 receiver in standard, 18 in PPR. So we know he has that top 20, top 15 upside depending on the format. And, you know, given, you know, he's playing with uh, Philip Rivers, which is he's a good quarterback and behind Keenan Allen, who has not been the most durable player over the last couple of years. So if Allen goes down with another injury, you have a, you have a player who's definitely has wide receiver one upside and you can get him in the eighth or ninth round. I just took him in the ninth round and fell 10. I just feel like he's way undervalued this valued this year. Agree. He was on my list, too. <laughs> oh, was he really? That's awesome. Yeah, I actually moved him all the way up to wide receiver number 26. His ADP is wide receiver number 44 right now. We're talking about someone who was a top 15 wide receiver last year and wasn't even the, the wide receiver one for, you know, the entire year. He just really emerged. So what can he do this year, especially with Keenan Allen lined up opposite of him, drawing away a lot of the attention? I'm really impressed with him. And, you know, we talk about Matt Harmon all the time when we talk about wide receivers because he does some awesome work with their route running trees. He says Terrell Williams has one of the best route running trees in all of football. That's uh, that's impressive. I didn't even I, I missed that myself. I'm saying that. But Tyrell Williams on his resume now, after just one year of playing with Philip Rivers, essentially, he already has a higher fantasy football finish than Keenan Allen has ever had. And I, yeah. you could throw injuries out there, but that's part of it, guys. Like we all have to look at all this stuff. But my issue and. In- Everybody knows that I'm not a Keenan Allen lover, right? But the problem here is that you can't project Keenan Allen for top 20 numbers and project Tyrell Williams for top 30 numbers. It just doesn't work when you add in Antonio Gates, Hunter Henry, Melvin Gordon being a top six running back, like all these things. And people are kind of forgetting about Travis Benjamin, who who I I guess is supposed to be playing that Malcolm Floyd role that, you know, they signed him to a big money contract last off season. So I don't think we should forget about him because he was playing hurt through a lot of last year. So my concern is that this offense becomes extremely unpredictable. Uh, We've talked about their schedule on the show before where the AFC West has a brutal schedule this year. It's not very good. So for me with Tyrell Williams, the upside is certainly there, but if you're going to say Tyrell Williams has that upside, I think you also have to say that the Keenan Allen is not going to live up to expectations. I knew there was, I can't remember who it was, but someone was telling me they had Keenan Allen outside their top 30 wide receivers because of this. Uh, Christopher Harris has him really deep. I was talking to him today. I don't remember how far, but I think maybe outside his top 30. That's kind of crazy to me, but um, I've talked about Keenan Allen enough. I'm going to give my next guy, but first I want to tell you about yourrules.com. Before you just use the same commissioner service as always, there's a hot new site offering some incredible new customizable features. Instead of set it and forget it with yourrules.com, you've got the ability to manage the outcome of your weekly matchup. They're the first site out there to offer a fantasy experience that's much closer to how a real football game is managed. I'll definitely be using their site this year to take advantage of some of these features. To learn more about in-game substitutions, points for penalty yardage, and the unique ability to handle injuries, head over to yourrules.com and register for the 2017 NFL season. Your Rules is fantasy sports your way. That's www.yourrules.com. Okay, so Tyrell Williams was actually the next guy that I was going to talk about. So I guess it's time to talk about Eric Decker again. I mean, I've only really hit on him for one episode, and, uh, you know, I had a real hot take on him. I mean, you look at what he's done over the past two seasons. Wide receiver number 11 in terms of points per game. Wide receiver number 14 in terms of points per game. He has two top 10 finishes in his career. Granted, it was with Peyton Manning, but this is a really good wide receiver. When he's on the field, he is startable every single game in every single matchup. And granted, he's probably going to only play six to 10 games like he usually does, but 
let's say he stays on the field for 15, 16 games this year. If I knew that was going to happen, I'd draft him right there around Demarius Thomas, around Keenan Allen, around Devontae Adams, DeAndre Hopkins, Allen Robinson. Eric Decker's a very good wide receiver in this league, guys. Well, so my question, though, Bobby, is that so you had Corey Davis, too, right? So how are we able to project either of these guys when they both kind of cancel each other out? That's my issue with it, is that I think Eric Decker is best suited for the number two role. I think that's that's not a secret. You know, I think that's why they brought him in to play with Corey Davis, apparently in practice before Corey Davis went down. Davis was the number one. Decker was being moved. Uh, he was playing in two wide receiver sets, being moved into the slot when they go three wide. So they're going to use him all over the field. And, you know, he's able to catch touchdowns. He's shown that throughout his career. The For injuries sure. are, are the injuries are what they are. You know, he he is an aging wide receiver, I guess. Uh, but for me, it just comes down to pure volume and the fact that this I don't think this passing offense can support wide receivers. And it was, it's kind of like my same feeling that I had on uh, Corey Davis. I think Decker is the safest option of these wide receivers because you don't bring him in on a one-year deal unless you're going to use him. But um, I have my concerns in terms of a pure volume out of this passing attack. You know, I know they have a great running attack and everything. One of the best offensive lines in football for, for run blocking. But with that being said, I mean, you remember, I'm sure you remember this text during the middle of the year last year for eight weeks, Marcus Mariota was the number one fantasy scorer in fantasy football. I know the schedule strength was pretty weak, but this is a guy who can put up yards. He can put up touchdowns and now he's got weapons. So I I don't have him ranked seven or eight or anything like that, but there's significant upside with Mariota, with Decker and with Corey Davis. And I'm not saying that both Decker and Davis are going to finish his top 20 guys, but one of them could finish his top 12. The issue for me is that I don't think that Marcus Mariota is an elite quarterback. I don't think that he's in the conversation with with Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, and those guys. I don't think so at all. Agreed. And so, you know, we've, ta- we've talked about it before with Matt Ryan. We are looking for touchdown regression with Marcus Mariota. He threw too many touchdowns last year. That's why Rashard Matthews finished as the number 13 wide receiver, 15 or whatever it was. Uh, it's because he was throwing touchdowns. His yardage, he still threw for less than 3,500 yards. His rushing yards are going to go down. Uh, like, th- there's, there's a lot of concerns about Mariota for me. But I think if we talk about touchdown regression in terms of touchdown percentage, I think that's all but given with Marcus Mariota. So that's and so I, I remember that stretch because I remember calling him Mary Goda because I played him or I was telling people to play him in DFS like nonstop during that stretch. But uh, but yeah. So, John, John, what's your take on this? I mean, are you are you with me in the fact that there's not enough volume to go around? Do you have concerns about Decker? Like, where are you at with him? Well, I've got, you know, I'm aware of the touchdown regression as well. Uh, TJ Hernandez at 4 for 4 does a great series on, on touchdown regression, and Mariota is one of those guys. But, uh, you know, he and I discussed it, and given the uh, investment that they've made uh, in the passing game there, uh, given Mar- Mariota's, I mean, first 27 games as a pro, he's averaged, uh, I think, 17.7 fantasy points per game, which is what uh, Dak Prescott scored as a number six quarterback last year. So I have Mariota in my top five. I'm one of those crazy people that uh, think that he can actually <laughs> – uh, can actually do it. So I, uh, I like it. Uh, but even with that, so I even have him, him in my top five, I've got, uh, Delaney Walker, Richard Matthews, uh, Corey Davis and Eric Decker, all, um, projected for, you know, 55 to 65 catches, 800 or so yards and five to seven touchdowns. And I really don't see uh, any of these guys emerging unless there's some sort of injury or big change in the depth chart where, you know, one of these guys is getting only 50, 40% of the snaps, um, where I, as of right now, I think that they're all going to see plenty of playing time and, and he's going to spread the ball around. So I'm curious. So I want to, I want to stop here for just for a second. I want to see John, where, where do you have Mar- Mariota projected in terms of pass attempts? Because I just don't see them jumping very much. And obviously, you know, with his broken leg and you know, all that stuff is that I just don't know if he's going to be running the ball as much. So I guess I'm curious uh, where, where we differ in this. All right. So 327 completions, 535 attempts, uh, 4,200 yards. So I do have an increase there in uh, total yardage. Uh, But, you know, I have him for 16 games instead of 15. Uh, And then uh, 31 touchdowns, uh, 57 rush attempts, 333 rushing yards and two rushing touchdowns. So, I I mean, I think the offense takes a step forward. Yeah, no, it's fair. Those are fair. And that's why I was just wondering. It's just a little more past attempts than I projected. I think a little bit more rushing. But, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. But at the same time, even after all that, you know, we both come back to the conclusion that it's hard for one of these guys to emerge as a clear cut, you know, top 15 wide receiver. Okay, guys, we're going to go one more round here. So, Tags, who's your last wide receiver with upside to talk about? All right, so since I have to go with the one more, I'm going to pick the one that I don't think we've talked about on the show yet. And it's one that— You're going to pick my guy. I just know you're going to pick my guy. <laughs> 
I posted on Twitter, it was last week, I want to say, about Paul Richardson uh, in the Seattle Seahawks offense and that, you know, the beat writers started reporting that Paul Richardson was running a- ahead of Jermaine Curse, And it's something that I've been waiting to see, waiting to hear. I grabbed him late in a, in a couple MFL 10s before even hearing that because Paul Richardson was someone who was relied upon in this offense over the final four weeks of the season, including the playoffs. If you look at the last four games, he saw 21 targets over that time, just so it's about five and a half per game. Uh, turning them into 15 receptions, 213 yards, and two touchdowns. I think people have forgotten that this guy is a former second-round pick by the Seattle Seahawks regime, who is the same one in there, obviously. Jermaine Curse was one of the least efficient wide receivers in football last year. Tyler Lockett suffered a gruesome injury, and I know that some people keep telling me, they're like, Mike Richardson's only out there as the number two until Tyler Lockett's healthy in that I'm not banking on on Lockett coming back as the same player, and I don't know how people are just assuming that after that injury he suffered that he's going to. You know, he's a player His career that might be over a lot. That that's I that's the thing. I don't know if it's over because they're saying he's coming along nice in his in his recovery. But we heard similar things about Jamal Charles last year. Granted, he's young; he could bounce back from injuries a little bit better than someone who's older like Jamal Charles. But for me, Tyler Lockett's a guy that relies a lot on speed, a lot on agility. He's not a guy that's going to win jump balls or anything like that. So when you have a bad ankle injury like the one that he did, it doesn't look great. And Paul Richardson looked really, really good in his role last year. And as I mentioned, this is a Seattle Seahawks offense who's going to be top 10 in scoring. So why don't you want to choose someone outside of Doug Baldwin? I I mean, people, I, I know why they like Baldwin, but Baldwin himself has been a bit inconsistent, even though he's finished as a top 12 wide receiver in each of the last two seasons. He's been volatile on a week-to-week basis. So Paul Richardson could turn out to be a steal late in drafts. I like that one. I mean, Baldwin is not a prototypical type of stud. He doesn't have a great athletic profile. He's like five foot ten. He's playing a lot out of the slot and everything. Richardson definitely has the athletic ability to emerge. Um, this Seattle offense is goofy, though, so... I'm not going to put any stock in it, but upside, yeah, yeah, Richardson's there. He could be a wide receiver too. I have him down to six foot PS, um, but but I was like, wait a minute, he can't be that short because I didn't think he was that short. He is, he's thin. Um, he needs to put on some weight if he's going to be like somewhat of a possession guy. But John, have, have you given any thought to Paul Richardson? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Richardson is an interesting player. He's also basically free, so if you want to take a flyer on him at the end of the draft, that's fine. I think I would rather have Lockett since his, he was running ahead of Richardson last year before getting injured. Lockett's back uh, off of pup and has been fielding punts at, at uh, practice even. So I think uh, you know he's he's feeling okay and is coming along uh, nicely. And uh, you're this is an offense that doesn't throw a ton. Uh, you know, Russell Wilson had about 550 pass attempts last year. Uh, previous years, it's been under 500. So you have Doug Baldwin as the clear number one. You have Jimmy Graham uh, coming on and getting healthier in the second year after the uh, his surgery uh, as the number two option. And then now you're you're talking about the third option, uh, kind of a lower volume uh, passing game. Uh, Richardson does have like could be turn into a starter fantasy starter type if all these things happen if Lockett falls off uh, with an injury or whatever else if curse basically takes a back seat so only playing 20 or 30 percent of the snaps and uh you know wilson throws 550 to 600 passes and has a good year in terms of touchdowns i think then richardson gets into that conversation although you know that you're talking about a lot of like almost a perfect storm but you know, with these guys drafted in the final rounds, you, you're generally looking at a perfect storm uh, to get a fancy starter out of there. You're right. Okay, John, so who's your last guy for us? Well, uh, do you guys talk a lot about Willie Sneed or Cameron Meredith on the pod? Because I can talk about the other guy. You know, we haven't really talked about either two, so go ahead and make your case for both. All right. Well, Willis Need, a uh, really good route runner, fared really well in uh, Matt Harmon's reception perception. Um, and you have Brandon Cooks there leading. So he's just one of those players that I think sees an uptick in, in, in targets. Uh, he probably is due for some positive regression in uh, his touchdowns, uh, given the offense that he plays in. He hasn't been real involved in the red zone, but I think he'll get a couple more just uh, by happenstance. And if he, you know, he has his if he sees another 20 targets at his career fantasy points per target, which is 1.8, then I think he'd finish in the top 20. Uh, I like I like getting guys that are ascending and in, in really good offenses, and he's one of them. Uh, as for Meredith, uh, he's already shown that he can produce as a top 15, top 16 type receiver. From week five on, he averaged five catches for 70 yards, 0.33 touchdowns. Uh, that works out to about 14 fantasy points per game in PPR formats. That's that's what Demarius Thomas scored last year as the number 16 receiver. Uh, you know, in, in PPR formats. So uh, he was especially, 
impressive. Those numbers are impressive considering that he had like a weird week seven to week 10 stretch where he only saw uh, two targets per game. Uh, he's got the big frame, a great, great catch radius. Uh, the Bears are not going to be good. So, you know, the, the passing attempts should be up there for Mike Lennon. I think Mike Lennon is a, is a decent quarterback there and he can deliver the ball. Uh, not real huge on Kevin White. I think White uh, has some upside as well uh, in the 12th, 13th, 14th round. Uh, but I think Meredith is definitely the best player there. And as the 38th receiver off the board, you're getting a guy who could finish in the top 20. I'll, uh, I'm going to ask you about Cameron Meredith here in a second, Tex, because I know you watched the Bears a little closer than me. But when I saw him play last year, I mean, there's a reason he wasn't starting at the beginning of the year, right? I mean, he reminds me a ton of Kamar Aiken. Cameron Meredith was the only guy there last year with Alshon Hurt and Kevin White Hurt. Kamar Aiken was the only guy with the Ravens two years ago, and he still got 900 yards and six or seven touchdowns, and Cameron Meredith did the same last year. But, I mean, I watch him, and I'm just not impressed whatsoever. I think that Kevin White is clearly the best talent uh, in that offense, and so I just don't see Meredith repeating. So my issue with Meredith, so a lot of people have asked me this question being a Bears fan and watching all their games and that. So Meredith, my issue with him is that, yes, he was a former undrafted free agent. Yes, Kevin White is going to be used in this offense, regardless of what you think about him, regardless of what, you know, you think he lost his burst or if he's a bust or what, I don't care what you think about it. The Bears are going to find out what they have in Kevin White this year, and it may come at the expense of Cameron Meredith. And the reason I say that is because the Bears felt it necessary to go out and sign Victor Cruz. Uh, by all accounts, he's He's doing fine in preseason. The Bears are keeping him. He's on the roster. You don't keep someone like Victor Cruz around and not use him. They also went out and they signed Marcus Wheaton, which is a joke. Um, I don't even want to talk about Marcus <laughs> Wheaton, but they also signed they they signed Kendall Wright, who is another guy that can play out the yeah, side like as well. Wright. So here, so my issue, I do too. I think that Wright was kind of underused in Tennessee, and I think that there was a disconnect between him and the coaching staff, whatever the case. But so with Meredith. Do I think the upside is there? For sure. We, we saw it last year. I also think that people underestimate how good Brian Hoyer actually is, is an NFL quarterback. You know, we saw him support Cameron Meredith. We saw him support DeAndre Hopkins. You know, he's been a quarterback that can support a top tier wide receiver. Now, after, as you went later in the season, though, we saw the Bears slowly transition Cameron Meredith into the slot. And that's when he had two of his better performances against Green Bay and Washington late in the season. So Meredith think about those is, defenses, is though, Green Bay and field. Washington, man. Well, I'm not saying Green Bay is something, but I mean, Washington, eh, whatever. But I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, will he get enough targets or and or playing time to justify, you know, a 10th round pick or 9th round pick, which is where he's going. And I think you can make the case where there you like, I, I, I understand John's case and why you would want to draft Cameron Meredith. I have my concerns, but but when you're that late in drafts, there's going to be risk with every single player. And we've we've seen Cameron, Cameron Meredith perform. I mean, four. 100 plus yard games and you know in his first season where he actually played so you know he kind of that's big time yeah bit. I just prefer John Brown in that range so I'm not especially excited about him oh for sure um, you know I've got Cameron Meredith a little lower than ECR just because of my love for Kevin White but Meredith does has the have the upside he showed it um, I'm with you and Willie Sneed every point you made I'm right with you John yeah, and I would just add that uh, I, I took uh, Matt Harmon's data from his reception perception and kind of put, put it all into one number because I like to have a, a ranking at the end of the day because he does a great job with uh, gathering all this data. He does the right of these right? Uh, players. And that and that's, yeah, it's really great information. Uh, but you it's hard to figure out where he's, you know, where the numbers put each of these guys. And Mer Meredith finished, out of the 50 guys that he charted, Meredith finished 18th once I combined all the numbers out of 50. Sneed finished uh, sixth. So you're talking about two of the top top tier type uh, uh, path, uh, uh, route runners, uh, maybe Sneed being a little bit better than, than Meredith in that category. But Meredith certainly showed well uh, compared to some of the other guys that uh, he charted. So uh, I have a deep sleeper, and it's not someone with especially high upside, but someone that I think is, uh, is at least worth mentioning while we're talking about high upside wide receivers. And that's our Darius Stewart, and I feel so dirty for even saying that. But he is starting for the Jets, and he's one of these guys that we don't know that much about. He's got a nice athletic profile. And Robbie Anderson's the number one. Jets are going to be playing from behind so much. Maybe, just maybe, Stewart will end up all right. I mean, I'm not drafting him in a standard league, but he's a name to watch out for. But the guy I want to talk about for my last player is Dante Moncrief. We haven't mentioned him all that much right now. His ADP is number 33. This is a guy drafted in the top 50 last year in most leagues, and he really didn't disappoint. He was just hurt. I know he's not going to get a ton of yards. He probably won't finish with 1,000. But if you told me Dante Moncrief had 15 touchdowns this year, 
it really wouldn't surprise me that much because he's among the best in the NFL at grabbing the ball up in the red zone. Uh, I, I, I'm not high on Moncrief due to the yardage issue, and I, I think that the touchdowns are nice, but if you're depending on that uh, with, with what's going on with Luck and his uh, shoulder, uh, the quality of that offensive line. I'm certainly yeah. not depending on Moncrief. I'm, I'm not really even drafting him. I've got him right where ADP is. But I think because of the touchdown upside, it's a, it's a real nice ceiling. Yeah, and ADP is a little high for me, so I don't have any shares of him at this point, to get, given where I have him ranked. That's just my my take on Moncrief. Yeah, I want to say, didn't, wasn't Harmon extremely high on Moncrief? Because like, I've been a Moncrief fan for a while. I think that he's better than advertised, but you know, you're right. And the fact of his yardage has not been there because his targets have not been there. I want to say when I went and looked at it, I think last week I was looking at it, that he was ranked 49th among wide receivers and targets per game. Like that's not going to get it done. You're not going to finish. You're not going to finish as a top 15 wide receiver if you're not getting the targets. Like that's just the bottom line. Yeah, Moncrief actually finished when I rolled the numbers into one number. He was 19th right after uh, Cameron Meredith. So I, I'm not sure about the write up that he. I don't remember what he wrote about Moncrief, but the route running is there. It's it's solid for sure. All right, tags. Let's answer questions from the listener mailbag. And uh, if you want to send in questions, it's mailbag at fantasypros.com, or you can hit up tags on Twitter at Mike Taglier and. NFL or me on Twitter at Bobby Fantasy Pro. Okay, Tags, what's the first question? All right, so the one question I wanted to ask, and I think it's a good one for John, being you know as accurate he's been as he's been over the years. Uh, the one was, do you ever stray from your rankings during a draft and take a player in the same tier, but that you have ranked lower? And what are the factors that would what are the factors that would make you do that? Uh, I do do that from time to time, and a lot of it is I have a couple players in the same tier that are ranked closely. And for example, this year I have uh, Michael Crabtree ranked ahead of, say, Willie Sneed. And I could get Crabtree in the fourth round pretty much every single draft if I wanted to. And if I'm doing uh, 20, 30, 40 MFL 10s, I don't want to have 20, 30, 40 shares of, of Michael Crabtree. So I will. I also like Sneed, as we discussed earlier. So I will take him uh, every now and then. If I, uh, It also just sort of depends on the... Uh, uh, the other receiver I have already drafted or two receivers I already drafted. If I have uh, a high upside guy, but a, a low floor, then I might draft, a, like you uh, mentioned, a Pierre Garçon, a safer play or a Crabtree in the fourth, um, as opposed to maybe uh, uh, Tyree Kill uh, in the fourth. If Tyree Kill, I think, is, has a wider range of uh, of outcomes. And if I have uh, Julio Jones already locking down my one, number one spot, I'm more uh, likely to take somebody like Kill in the fourth round for some upside. Yeah, that's I couldn't have said it better. When you play in a lot of leagues and when you do a lot of different things, yes, it does vary for me as well. Uh, I don't want to be overloaded on one particular player. Like like I I find myself drafting John Brown almost every draft to the point where I was like, okay, maybe sometimes I should take some Jeremy Macklin. So I have because I like him and they're in that similar range. So sometimes I'll do it just because I play in so many different leagues. But if you're one of those people that you know, um, if you play in one league, if you're playing in one or two leagues, I, I would probably follow my rankings for the majority of the time, just because th there's a reason that you've put that player over it. And that's my biggest advice. So if you're in one or two drafts and you're one of those guys and you're putting together your rankings before the draft, actually every single player that you get to look at the next player on the list and say, all right, I'm in the draft right now. Would I take this player or this player? You obviously just keep going down the list and do that. And so when you go into your draft, you don't overthink it. It's like, who is the exactly. next player on my list? I asked myself this when it, it, there was no pressure on me, you know, and this was the answer I came up with. So that's my biggest advice I can give. Yeah, I, I really don't do this very much. I pretty much stick to my rankings. Like even if I drafted five high upside guys, if the next guy on my list is Jamal Williams, who's another high upside guy, you know what? I'm going for it. I don't mind having eight, nine high upside guys on my on my team because, you know, if four or five of them hit, I probably win the championship, right? And it's the same kind of thing with with safe players. If I've got eight, nine safe players on my team, then then I'm really happy with how my team looks, and you know I'll, I'll find upside on on the waiver wire. But I don't stray from my rankings very often unless it has to do with like buys or you know having too many players on the Browns or Rams or something like that. <laughs> um, all right, so I want to get into this question. It's it's an interesting one, and it we try and stay away from keeper questions in the show because they can be very um, very specific to one person's league. But this is a good question because it can a lot of people can relate to it. Okay, this guy John. So I'm going to give you the scenario. Basically, it comes down to it's a PPR league. 0.25 points per rush. All right, he has David Johnson that he can keep for a first round pick. He has LaShawn he doesn't McCoy he doesn't know the draft order third, by, by the way. Right, he has LaShawn McCoy he can keep for a third round pick and Isaiah Crowell for a ninth round. At what point do you say um, you just take David Johnson, right? I mean, or do you take the value in LaShawn McCoy for a third, Isaiah Crowell for a ninth? 
I would just keep David Johnson this year. I mean, him and uh, Le'Veon Bell are just so far ahead. I like McCoy as well, but uh, the, so far ahead, those two. You have Elliott with his uh, suspension sort of looming, and then you the, the drop off at running back after the top eight or so guys. Uh, I would just I would take Dot Johnson and just burn the first round pick on him. Yeah, I, the, the 0.25 per rush doesn't factor in too much for me, Keith. Just so you know, I know you asked that in the email. It doesn't factor in too much for me either because every running back kind of fits along that tier and running backs are ranked in terms of how we feel the volume is going to be right. So me personally, I also go with David Johnson. Whenever you make a trade in fantasy football, you want to get the best player in the trade. And in this case, you're getting the best player of it. So David Johnson is for me. So the way that I look at this, I wrote an article last week uh, about keeper values and, and trade values before the draft and everything. And basically the value that you're going to get out of the first round, um, you don't know what pick you're going to get right now, 271, okay? David Johnson is worth 335 because he's the same value as the number one overall pick. So you're basically saving 64 in value by keeping Johnson with the first that is really, really hard to beat. With that being said, with LaShawn McCoy, you're actually keeping an extra 100. So LaShawn McCoy is the answer for me. I know Isaiah Crowell is a nice value too. All three of those are great options, but I lean towards McCoy by about 30 value points. And I know that's a little bit uh, abstract for you guys, but um, you know, if you, want, if you want to take a look at the, the, uh, the chart in the article, it explains how it all works. Um, but the answer is McCoy. Nice. Bobby's an abstract analyst, guys. <laughs> okay, guys. So we got one more listener mailbag question. It's from Lane in Texas. We actually get this question like every single week, multiple times a week. And I always respond the same way, but I just wanted to say it over the podcast, um, you know, in case there's probably a dozen, maybe a hundred more people who have the same question. A lot of you play in these six point QB touchdown leagues. Tags, how much does it change your rankings? I mean, obviously, you can use the uh, the auction calculator, the, the cheat sheet creator for customized leagues on our site. I would point everyone that direction for no matter what kind of league you have. But just for a shorthand answer, Tags, how much would it change your ranking of, say, Aaron Rodgers? It, it, it bumps Rodgers up a little bit because he obviously throws touchdowns, but it doesn't it doesn't move him up like a whole round or anything like that. Whereas like right now, I'm, I'm comfortable drafting Aaron Rodgers at the start to mid fourth round, depending who's on the board. But, you know, with with that being the case, maybe the end of the third round, it doesn't move him very far because the only reason I'm, I'm debating Rodgers at that point is because all of the guarantees in quotes are off the board at that point so for me it doesn't if anything it lowers a couple quarterbacks for me like Tyrod Taylor I love Tyrod Taylor but you have to lower him down if you're playing in a six point passing touchdown league because he's not throwing for 30 touchdowns right so um, it, if anything it just hurts those the, the rushing quarterbacks and it helps you know the pocket passers like Rodgers although he does add some with his legs John, what do you think about this one? Yeah, I would agree. I would still wait on quarterback. That's generally my plan. Uh, the fourth round is the third, fourth round is where you start to see a, a hole in the draft that this year, especially. And I could understand in a in a six point pass, you know, touchdown league that you might want to pull the trigger on Brady or or Aaron Rodgers there if you're if you're trying to compare him to some of those players that are available uh, late third, early fourth. Uh, what uh, Mike said was absolutely correct. It basically stretches. Uh, the quarterback position out where the where the running quarterbacks are are now devalued versus the passing quarterback. So, for example, Tyrod Taylor, I have him at a QB thirteen in, in a four point pass TD league. He drops to seventeen in, in a six point pass TD league. So, in that case, I would be targeting Andy Dalton or Philip Rivers or uh, one of those players, those, those pocket passers, uh, so to speak, because uh, their their value is boosted versus guys like Taylor. Lane, to answer your question, uh, the, the way that I look at it is there's only four quarterbacks who really change in value. I mean, obviously, you've got those rushing ones as well uh, towards the back who go backwards. But you know that Rodgers, Brady, Breeze, and Andrew Luck, if Luck is healthy, are going to throw for an extra 10 touchdown passes above everyone else. I mean, that's an extra 20 free points. That's pretty substantial. So the way I do it, I just add 12% to their rank. Um, so right now, I have Aaron Rodgers as number 27 overall. You know, when you uh, take 12% away from that, I'm drafting him around 23, 24. So I only do that for the top four quarterbacks, but that's my general rule of thumb there. All right, guys. Well, that's all we have for the show today. John, we really appreciate you coming on. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun chatting with you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Good time. It's our pleasure. 
And for those of you guys listening at home, we've got three more shows coming up next week. We've got some good ones coming on next week. So make sure to subscribe on iTunes if you haven't already. We also still have the Pristine Auction signed jersey giveaway going on right now with Amari Cooper. We're giving away that jersey this Sunday. So make sure to get your entries in. All you have to do is subscribe and review us on iTunes. Then send a screenshot to contest at fantasypros.com. I also want to say thank you to the sponsor of today's shows, Draft, Stamps.com, and YourRules.com. For Mike Tagliere, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening and enjoy your football. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve.